Um, now, first I'm going to address the first example that we solved in the context of the Tresca criterion. Um, it was the closed and pipe example, which was internally pressurized and torqued. And remember that we found out the axial stress to be 300 MPa. That is the unit that I'm going to employ. Um, I'm not going to write it once again. Um, sigma tangential is equal to 600 MPa. And um, finally, we found out the shear stress on the plane with normal x in the tangential direction is equal to 212 MPa. And we omitted the third stress, so sigma 3 is equal to 0. In reality, the most critical point is the inner side where sigma 3 is sigma r equals minus the pressure, but it was only 20 MPa. It's thin walled, it's really negligible. So we're going to say sigma 3 is equal to sigma z is equal to 0 uh, because it makes a negligible um, difference. Okay, so that's the state of stress. And now, uh, for the same material, where remember the yield strength is 1791, MPa, I would like to calculate the safety factor against yield for the formesis criterion. And in doing so, uh, first we'll have a chance to compare it against the um, Tresca result, and then we will be able to discuss an aspect that we discussed in the second example to Tresca, namely, do we always have to calculate the principal stresses in order to ultimately evaluate what the criterion is. So that's the question that I'm going to try. Both of those questions are uh, what I'm eventually after as a way of demonstration. So here we would like to um, remember the values of the principal stresses that we calculated. So sigma 3 is equal to 0. Sigma 1 we found out to be 709.7 NPa. And sigma 2 was equal to 190. Point 3 MPa. So the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to solve that problem um, with the principal picture. Um, and let us try to um, think about that picture and I'll give you a way to easily remember also the Formesis criterion which I do expect uh, to be remembered by you as well. So uh, I want to calculate an equivalent normal stress that has to do with the Formesis criterion and ultimately I'll compare it against the sigma naught value and the safety factor that I'm seeking once I know sigma bar h is given as the ratio of sigma naught to sigma bar h. Okay, So um, well, how do I formulate that criterion? Now you probably will easily remember how to formulate that criterion for the Tresca criterion. Um, because for the Tresca criterion, I know that, and I can easily remember that, I have to simply look at the absolute value of the differences in the principal stresses. Let's write the third one to emphasize that it's zero. And I need to take the maximum among those absolute value differences. So in the present case, I am going to square them square the differences. So instead of looking at the absolute value of the differences, I'll take their square. So square is a way to make everything positive, right? Uh, and then instead of taking looking at them individually, I'm going to sum them up. Uh, but now the units of this quantity is MPA, but this is stress squared, MPA squared. So why don't I take the square root? Okay, so very much like Tresca, but I sum the squares and then square root to make the dimensions correct. And then I look well, if I take, have a uniaxial stress scenario, sigma 2 and 3 are 0. So I have 2 sigma naught squared is going to be equal to sigma naught. Take the square root. If I scale it by square root 2, again, uniaxial case, set sigma 1 equals sigma naught, sigma naught squared, another sigma naught squared. So 2 sigma, square root 2 sigma naught 
will be less than or equal to sigma naught. That's wrong. If I scale it by a factor of root 2, then the equality will hold for the uniaxial case as well. And that way I can easily remember the phonesis criterion. Okay. Um, in practice, of course, uh, we don't have to memorize uh, things, but at this stage, I think it's important to uh, think about certain things like how to determine the critical limit that we are comparing against. Um, all right, so that's the criterion in terms of the principal stress. So if you go ahead and plug in these values into that equation, you will find with this principal picture that sigma bar h is equal to um, 636.3. MPA. Sigma naught is given and therefore you will find a safety factor of um, 2.81. Now at this point you may want to go back to the Tresca criterion and remember that the safety factor for Tresca predicted for exactly the same scenario was 2.52. So it's less. Why is it less? Well because I know Tresca is more conservative. Is it a lot more conservative? No. The difference between the two numbers is about 10%. So it's not a huge difference. On top of that huge safety factor, a 10% error is not a big issue in, in, in practice. Um, whether I use one criterion or the other is a matter eventually of mostly convenience. So that's the principal picture. But what I told you before is that it's not always convenient to work in terms of the principal picture. Sometimes given the general state of stress, the original picture, in terms of x and t and xt, uh, it might be easier to calculate sigma bar h. Now, of course, um, we don't have to memorize this expression in particular, but also it's not too hard, I would say. So first of all, I have to remember that if I have only sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, they act as principal stresses. So in other words, if I have no shear stress, I can think of x as 1, y as 2, and z as 3 and this criterion is going to be satisfied again. Um, however, if I and, and a scaling factor of square root 2 appears for the same reason. However, if there are shear stresses, certainly they will contribute to whatever goes into that criterion because depending on whether there is shear or not, yielding may occur or not. So it turns out shear goes in as an additional factor through a factor of 2 multiplying the sum of the squares of the shear stresses that have to do with each component. Factor of 6, sorry, multiplying tau xy squared plus yz squared plus xz squared. Okay. And then you would like to still, of course, this is sigma bar h, that's less than or equal to um, sigma naught. Okay? Um, so that is a essentially a um, the formulation of the Fomesis criterion in terms of the original picture without having to go into the effort of calculating the principal stresses, which might be hard with an eigenvalue problem if for instance, all of the components of the stress are actually uh, present. So now if I do that, then I don't have to really calculate the principal stresses. I can directly take these and plug them in there. And of course, no surprise, I will get exactly the same value and therefore exactly the same safety factor of 2.81. Why? because this is just theoretically an alternative formulation of sigma bar h, the same quantity that I'm comparing against the critical value, uh, but not in terms of the principle, but rather in terms of the original um, stress components. Okay, um, So that was the first example that I wanted to um, solve. Another example now that I'd like to sh solve is... one that has to do with the topics that we have uh, considered before. And those topics um, were on mostly elastic behavior. And it's a nice example to combine elasticity with failure criteria 
because we're going to start with elastic loading and we're going to predict as we load elastically how the stress components change so that we can predict the onset of failure um, in the context of this particular loading. So uh, let us take a very special geometry. So I'm going to consider a block okay, um, that is supported between two rigid supports. So this is rigid and so is that one. Okay. Um, the directions are Z, X, and Y. And we know that this is an isotropic material with parameters E and nu, and it has a yield strength of sigma naught. Okay? Um, and we are loading this material by imposing a normal compressive stress of value of a negative value sigma y in addition to a compressive stress in the extraction so equal in magnitude and also it's also compressive okay and the problem being given so the question is uh, in this scenario, again, as we've done earlier in similar uh, generalized um, loading scenarios, uh, as we've done before, we're going to omit that there is no friction, so we're not going to have to worry um, about shear stresses. The question is, find sigma y, which is equal to sigma x, for yielding okay so we would like to find sigma y as a function of sigma naught essentially um all right well uh this is a case with the principal stresses being equal to the normal stresses along the xyz direction but because there is no shear stress okay no shear uh, due to frictionless supports. So what I have to do is ultimately I need to take the criterion which remember we just did it we want to calculate the equivalent normal stress for the von Mises criterion and we'd like to make sure that in general it's less than or equal to sigma naught and that criterion is equal to 1 over square root 2 square root of the differences in the stresses. So the differences are sigma 1 minus 2 or x minus y because they are already principal stresses plus y minus z squared plus z minus 1 squared everything square root all right and i am given sigma y which is equal to sigma x so i know that this term is equal to zero and that is sigma y minus x so this is sigma y as well and therefore i have from this result an expression which says that sigma bar h is equal to so two times the same quantity square root scaled by that so it's equal to sigma y minus sigma z square square root so why don't i square both sides and say that eventually if it's equal to sigma naught squared so I'll extend this analysis um, if I have this squared equals sigma naught squared then I have failure so that's the onset of failure and now 
I start loading and I increase sigma x and y proportionally, they are equal, I keep compressing and I want to find out when failure occurs. In other words, what's the value of sigma y in terms of sigma naught in, at which failure occurs. But I don't know what sigma z is. Okay? So I need to have some information about how sigma z also proportionally increases during this loading as a function of sigma y, depending on the elastic behavior. So where does that information come from? This one you should be able to answer very quickly. We remember generalized Hooke's law, which says that the strain in the third direction is equal to 1 over e sigma z minus sigma x plus y times the Poisson ratio. And in this particular case, we know that the strain in the third direction is zero because the blocks are rigid, they do not move. And therefore, from this equality, I find that sigma z is equal to nu times sigma x plus y, but they are equal, and sigma x is equal to sigma y, so it's equal to 2 nu sigma y. Okay, So this is equal to sigma y, and that's our result. So now I go ahead and combine these two and ultimately find that um, sigma y multiplying 1 minus 2 nu everything squared is equal to sigma naught squared is the onset of yielding okay so this is the requirement for yielding to occur that's the value of sigma y so clearly this thing has two roots it can be sigma y equals plus or minus sigma naught over 1 minus 2 nu all my argument has of course rested on the fact that the Poisson ratio is positive so the material tries to expand the straining along the z direction is zero and therefore this thing because it's for an isotropic material bond bounded by 0.5 is for sure positive this is positive and therefore if I really want to have a compressive stress as I want in that scenario sigma y value is not the positive one but it's actually the negative one so that's the answer to my question now let me give you a quick question additional question what would be the case if I had required that the um, Poisson ratio, just for fun, could be negative. How would this problem change? Why don't you think about that um, for a second? Okay, so if you've thought about it, well, the way it changes is, is actually very simple. If the Poisson ratio is negative, the material will try to contract as I compress it, and therefore, I don't really have to worry about sigma z at all. It's going to be zero because the material is going to, if it's not connected, that's what I'm assuming, it's going to detach from the supports easily. So sigma z will be zero, and therefore, the value of the sigma y will be, in this case, equal to simply minus sigma naught. And the same thing would have happened if the Poisson ratio is still negative, but instead of pushing, I pull on the material, right? So whether I pull or push clearly is going to make a big difference. In this case, um, the ultimate strength, ultimate stress I can apply is of that magnitude, sigma naught over one minus two nu, but under tension uh, for a still a positive Poisson ratio, it's gonna be simply uh, sigma naught. Okay, so that again goes to show the complexity of um, the limit to the elastic zone, elastic behavior of the material, in other words the failure um, behavior uh, under state of complex states of loading and that's what we have been trying to predict with these different failure criteria and I think at this point we have a pretty good idea of how failure occurs and how we could possibly um, formulate it. And now, for the rest of the course, for a good while, our emphasis will be on trying to think about, well, okay, suppose I predict yielding, but I load the material nevertheless. What will happen after that?